We're recording to the cloud. Uh, yeah, so thanks everybody for showing up. Second 1559 implementers call. Uh, I'll share the agenda in the chat. It was pretty lightweight. Uh, so if there's other stuff that people want to cover, we definitely have the time for. Um, but uh, at a high level, I wanted to start with just some status updates from implementers. Then there was a PR that uh, Mika Zoltu, hope oh, I'm pronouncing his, right, his name right, uh, put that basically, uh, that basically changes 1559 to uh, not set a fixed uh, block size, but instead still leave the miners uh, the ability to decide that and just still aim for a 50% uh, 50 full blocks. Uh, after that, we'll have uh, Dan, your mockups. Then Abdel had some questions around consortium networks and then anything else if people want to chat about it. Um, yeah, so I guess for, for status updates, uh, uh, Ian, Abdel, I know Barnabé, you had uh, also some stuff you were working on, so feel free to, to go. Yeah, I can start uh, talking about Bezu. So last time we said uh, we would implement uh, the possibility to make all those parameters configurable. So we did that. Uh, we tested uh, also uh, with get uh, implementation in the small uh, local testnet, and we are uh, aligned uh, with the spec for the moment. Uh, and we are waiting to see uh, about uh, remove riders proposal. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that pretty much covers my update. About all I've done since the last meeting was uh, introduce those config options for the different parameters. Um, yeah, besides that, there hasn't been much. I still need to do a rebase, but at this point, I'm kind of putting that off as long as possible because I know there'll be more rebases going forward. <laughs> I, I can go next. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I've been working on, like, let's say, three different things. Uh, the first thing is one open question we had in the last meeting was if we really wanted to combine the elevator, escalator algorithm with EIP1559, uh, how would we do that? So I've tried to explore this question a bit. I've put a link in the Discord to a note that is on GitHub with like a few designs, some of them not very uh, good, I think, but one of them seems to be capturing, let's say, the ID of EIP1559 of having this base fee. Uh, but also like the idea of the escalator that you can sort of climb above. Um, oh, okay, yes, I can, I'll do that. Um, yeah, that you can climb above over people fees so that you have priority. Uh, one open question I have that I don't have a good idea for at the moment actually, is um, what are the kind of default values we expect for users who are signing their transactions. So maybe Dan is going to talk about this when he shows uh, some of the designs for the UX. But I, I was trying to reason from a place of, let's say, economics or game theory, like what do we expect uh, users should bid given, let's say, their value for the transaction or given their value for time? Uh, that's not clear to me. And I think it's a fairly difficult problem uh, that could use like more eyes on. And the third thing I wanted to do was uh, more of like a data analysis of current and past transactions. I wanted to try and get an idea of the regimes that we see currently on the chain. And even though we can't necessarily transpose that directly to what we should expect under EIP 1559, I think we can still get some ideas about the preferences currently of users. Uh, for instance, I was planning to look at how people maybe are replacing their transactions on the uh, mempool. So that gives you like an idea of, oh, they want this to go faster. So they have a higher preference for time. Like I wanted to use these kinds of natural experiments to, to get like a, a better understanding of this. And I don't think it has been done before, but I'm also not like fully aware of everything. So yeah, that was kind of my, my three, the three things I tried to tackle. Cool. Thanks for the update. Uh, and I see we have uh, Thomas and Artem on the call. So is there any update from Nethermind or, or Open Ethereum? Oh, yeah, sure. So, so far, I've made a lot of research. So I've read every single post that all of you guys ever produced. And so you were quite talkative, so it was not an easy task. Um, the, so far, I've, I really liked what uh, Barnaby was creating with his 
like agent uh, agent modeling the simulation. So I think this is the way to go. And I'm analyzing all the different approaches. And so far we haven't started implementation, but uh, we'll be ready to add all the code if needed. Uh, we definitely will have the less work for now since we don't really do the uh, proof of work mining. So we don't really have to worry that much about miners. One thing that I've never seen being mentioned in your discussions, maybe once shortly mentioned by Peter, was the uh, how we will decide to introduce these new transaction models into the click networks like Rinkaby and Gurley, whether we'll just stay with the old transactions forever or we'll move them all to the new model which maybe not necessarily has the same meaning for the networks where you don't have miners. So it'll be great to have uh, the decision here, how we, how we handle those other networks. Yeah, I think that was Abdel's point as well on the agenda around like IBFT for BASU as well, but yeah, non-proof of work yeah. networks. So yeah, we can definitely dig into that a bit, a bit more today. Um, Artem, anything from you? Um, no, we are currently focused on Berlin hard work. So, uh, 1559 is not on our immediate agenda right now. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, next up, uh, there was this, uh, PR I'll post it in the chat, uh, that, that basically tried to disassociate 1559 from having a fixed block size um, and leaving uh, basically still leaving that to miners like 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 is, is currently the case. Um, Mika could not make it to the call but um, yeah he was curious to get people's thoughts on this PR. Um, so I don't know if anyone has, has strong opinions on this. I think it's a fair point. Uh, it introduces a change that is not really the main focus of the IP 15559. So I'm in favor of, of, of Mika's PR. It seems to me that as long as the miners are not moving the block size as fast as, let's say, the base fee is moving, like if they are moving on two different time scales, uh, economically speaking, there shouldn't be like too many issues. Like uh, I, I can't be too strategic if I can only move. Um, uh, the block limit by let's say one percent every block or less than that. Uh, the base fee, I think, is allowed to change by over twelve point five percent each block, block to block. So as long as these two are not uh, too close to each other, it should be okay. But I bet it could use like some more modeling on this. Yeah, what is the the max that miners can push the block limits per block right now? It's either one over 1,024 or one, or one over 2,048 every block, I forget. It's definitely on one of the two. Which is way, way less than 12%. Right. Yeah. So that, okay. Does any, so I guess, yeah, does anyone think uh, this PR is a bad idea? Um, I would, hmm. So I, th I think it's a good idea in the sense that I like having it be an explicit decision that's, that's noted elsewhere. Because I've, I've noticed in the, or in the earlier days that people were still confused whether or not, oh, are we changing that the miners are deciding things? So I think it would be nice, and I can help anybody who would be willing to do this, to write an EIP that does change the the thing to being protocol specific, like the the thing to being protocol specific, and then we can have fifteen fifty nine require that, and then um, it just seems like there's that's something to really think about the consequences of. So we should have like both options. One is this EIP, this version that doesn't have it, and then we can have an EIP that changes it to a fixed, and then have fifteen fifty nine require it, and then kind of further just figure it out. Like I like the idea of removing the writer is what I what I'm saying but I'm not necessarily sure that that means we should not do it. Yeah, I tend to agree with James here. And if you look at my comments, it's obvious that I'm playing devil's advocate and I'm actually not super passionate about, um, about this choice. I'd, I'd be fine either way. Um, I think in general though, the state of the EIP should be determined by what is best for the EIP. Um, not, you know, what is best for the, perception of governance, but that's just a personal opinion.
And yes. how re so, sorry, I was just gonna say, how realistic would it be to say add you know the fixed block size or like the block size determined by the EAP in the future? Um, say we wanted to separate those two proposals. How like modular are they? I don't think it'd be very difficult. It's not exactly modular because these changes are spread throughout a bunch of different packages. And, um, but it, 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 I think it would take, you know, one or two days work to ship to one direction or the other. So I know, and I know in the past we talked like we'll want to have test networks up uh, to, to simulate this and, and make sure that things actually work in practice. Would it make sense then to accept Mika's PR uh, to kind of reduce the scope of the EIP, try to get that live on the test net and working and see if there are actually any security or performance issues from having, from keeping the blocks as is. Um, and if so, we can, uh, like you said, Ian, just add it back and it's, it's a fairly small change. Yeah, I think that is the best approach is to test both cases and actually figure out which one is the most sound implementation. So to be clear, you would test both in parallel? Well, I guess at this point, we already have tests underway for the current implementation. Um, yep. So yeah, I guess we, we could add it on in parallel, although this, I should defer to Abdel here because he's the one actually doing the testing. Um. Yeah, if we want to test both in parallel, I would advise to uh, make this uh, configurable as well to to have a flag to uh, enable or not uh, the riders. Uh, yeah, because we already have the implementation, so I would not remove it too soon. I would say, and maybe it was uh, testing with uh, large scale simulation and see the impacts uh, of both uh, approaches. Is there is there any timeline on when uh, tests will start like in terms of networks? Uh, Tim, what was not, the... not Not yet. I think, yeah, we wanted, so now we're at a spot where, you know, the get PR and the base UPR work together and we've run small local networks, but we don't have anything like a public network yet. And I think the the main kind of blockers uh, were uh, Dan's proposal. So uh, trying to analyze, you know, Dan's versus 1559 and how they work together. And now mm -hmm. there's maybe this other one around, you know, fixed block size versus minor decided block size. Um, so, but but I think, yeah, those are definitely things we could try out on the test network, but no one has like volunteered to set one up yet. Okay, thank you. So in terms of next steps for Mika's PR, um, should this be merged in then, or should, like, I, yeah, I'm not sure how we keep both in parallel and, and uh, yeah. It almost feels like it should uh, be like a, what, sorry, go I, ahead. Have, I have a question. What was the initial idea uh, behind having this rider? Because I don't have this context. Uh, because I guess it was intentional to, to add this. So. Um, it was mainly a, a, a simplifying measure. Um, it was basically mm. that there was like one, a field and a block, um, and then that was used for the uh, gas limit, and we need to have a field to store the base fee, so we might as well just repurpose an existing one because that's easier than changing data structures. Mm. Okay, so it was not correlated to any economic uh, concern or... Right. Yeah, okay, okay. So in that case, would it make sense to just merge Mika's PR, assume we're still keeping the minor decided block size to reduce the scope? And if there's an issue with that, you know, we can we can come back to the, to the fixed block size if that's a solution. But it feels like right now it's, it's probably gonna end up being simpler, just like politically to have this be a smaller change than, than to have it also take, like change this other thing with miners uh, if, if there's no strong need for it. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah, that seems reasonable to me. It would be great to have the 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 other PR open, the other EIP also open before we merge. 
one uh, the writers. What do you mean by the other EIP? So it's a the PR right now is a PR to EIP fifteen fifty nine. Right, and uh, somebody brought up uh, making an alternative PR oh. for the block size change. So basically, like the reverse diff of this PR. Exactly. Right? Like, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Doesn't have to be um, too much. I know it's a, it'll be a bit to fully detail it out, but just having it open to track it would be great. Uh, yeah, I think that sounds. I'd I think the the way to do that would be to propose an EIP to change the the minor to being uh, decided on the protocol level and not and like removing that part and then tagging fifteen fifty nine saying that this is an option that it might yeah. require it. So if you choose to to do it, then you require the the EIP that fixes the minor gas limit. It removes the, the minor control. Like write an EIP that removes my minor control of the gas limit and then have yep. and then have that be an optional requirement for fifteen fifty nine so it's easier to discuss the two. But do you think do you think this change uh, alone would have sense without EIP fifteen fifty nine? I mean if we create a separate EIP for the rider, could we Let's say we don't implement EIP fifty nine. Could this one be implemented without uh, in fifteen fifty nine? It certainly could. I don't see why we would. Yeah, and I guess what what you're saying by that is you you make it require a consensus fork to change the block gas limit, which I don't know from my perspective seems like it's, it's probably not the best idea. But there yeah. might be use cases for that. Um, but I, I like the idea of like just separating the concerns and making it kind of clean that. You know, EIP fifteen fifty nine does not require that, but then, um, but then there is this other EIP that we could add to fifteen fifty nine. Um, does anyone want to to kind of open that that uh, EIP, and 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 then we can merge because PR. I, I can do it. Okay, thanks, Ian. So, um, so yeah, so Maybe I guess once you. you Thanks, James. Yeah, once you have that, then we can merge because PR, and I guess we kind of have consensus that like if if like the client teams want to keep working on, on 1559, we can implement it in the way that's described in, in the PR from Mika. That makes sense? Yes, yeah, that makes sense to me. We, we will have to make um, changes to, to revert to that. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. Cool. Um, anything else on that? If not, uh, Dan, you want to walk us through uh, your work? Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so uh, at the last meeting, you know, I, I was raising some, uh, you know, wallet uh, perspective uh, concerns and thoughts about uh, the experience of this and the escalator algorithm, and uh, I agreed to prepare some designs to share. And uh, so I went through with uh, some of our designers down at MetaMask, and we did a, we did an exercise, and we you know we sketched up a whole bunch of ideas, uh, both for 1559 and the escalator algorithm. And uh, um, I don't know if before I start, I, I do think there is uh, some possibility for composability in, in uh, retrospect, having now gone through more of the uh, exercise. But uh, let's uh, let's dive in uh, 1559 first. Um, so uh, I think my favorite one for 1559 is probably like this one. Uh, is, let me see if this one's very different. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can do something, uh, yeah, incredibly simple. Yeah, so, so maybe this is, is like an example of what we're saying. So 1559, I think the happy path, I think everybody knows it, it's, it's got some really great promises, right? We should be able to expect a nice low cost. We should be able to expect a nice low time. Um, and the user's only primary expected parameter is the fee. And we think that we can make it very simple to you know, represent different orders of magnitude for the fee. And, and that's all fine. And that's nice. Um, and uh, you know, under advanced, it's possible we could show like a graph representing the recent uh, prices. The thickness of these lines was intended to represent maybe the, uh, the tips that were included on those given blocks uh, moving over time, the blue line representing what your current max fee or how far it is over the recent block average. Um, that's, that's also uh, pretty all right um, and pretty easy to do. Um, 
And then, uh, yeah, I think this is this is kind of an unlikely worst case. I, uh, so if there was a, a spike in congestion, which I, I don't know if we can realistically expect, like, like if we're trying to say you should pay more, I think we would have to see like, you know, serially more expensive blocks. And in theory, you're gonna approach a, a block that is not including transactions, but we could, we could anticipate a current a current ascent of blocks and we could maybe uh, estimate higher. Um, oh, also to address uh, Barnabé, uh, he was asking what we might suggest in terms of defaults. We discussed that a bit and we were thinking uh, initially probably a multiple of the current base fee. So if the current base fee is, uh, you know, if the last block's base fee was 21 cents, then we might uh, suggest double it or something as a, as a max fee and then suggest increments uh, over that. Um, that way it's, it's more dynamic. I don't think we would want to try to hard code uh, the, that fee. Um, this, this should be a user defined parameter. Um, something that's maybe not, oh, what's this? Uh, that's, oh, sorry, different design. Um, okay, uh, something that's maybe not represented there was uh, there's a question of, oh, the, the tip parameters like hardly represented here at all. Um, yeah, oh, so we can see it on the edge here. We were thinking maybe should it be set below or the EIP suggests the tip could be hard coded by wallet. And I think this is a really important question. And it's maybe, uh, you know, so if we if we hard coded as a wallet, I just want to ask everyone, like, what should we set it to? Should we set it to, to GUA? Um, my impression is that this could create a bidding war between wallets. Like, no wallet wants to be the, the wallet that's paying the least for a tip and then getting excluded. Um, and so that kind of seems like and there's not like a, I don't see an equilibrium for it like capping out exactly. Um, and and that's actually one of the reasons why um, I kind of have come to agree with Micah that the tip parameter may actually be eligible for if you were gonna compose with the escalator algorithm. Um, in terms of ways the escalator algorithm could work. Oh, oops. Uh, uh, yeah, so in the basic fee, we should be able to provide an experience that's very familiar to users where We've got half, uh, fast and low prices, uh, and um, and so these defaults would represent like slopes that are kind of invisible to the user. But for advanced users, they could define their 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 min and their max and their time preference, and possibly even see a visualization of it over a plot of recent transactions, um, which is a pretty cool way to do it. Um, and uh, the the reason I think that this can compose with uh, with fifteen fifty nine is because uh, both both algorithms use a, a max bid parameter. So both since both have a max price and the gas price paid is the lower of the two between the max price and the uh, the base P plus tip, um, we can set the uh, yeah, we can we can use it for both. So this escalation may happen faster if if the base P moves higher, uh, you may get to your higher prices faster, but you'll still be within this range at least. Um, and it solves the problem of that hard coding uh, a tip. I'm, I'm definitely a bit nervous about what it means for a wallet to hard code this tip parameter when it dictates the ordering of transactions within a given block. But um, other than that, I think that's a decent summary of kind of what we were, what we were seeing. Um, yeah, uh, anyways, this, these aren't like designs that we're necessarily committing to or saying are definitely the best. These are just kind of what we came up with after a couple of sessions. Um, and, you know, can serve as a starting point for, you know, community discussion about how this would best be represented to users. This looks great. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Thank you. This is great work. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I, shout out to, to our designers. We, I helped up three designers here. Um, so, uh, Rachel Cope, uh, Jake Halkin, and Christian Jerry. Yeah. This is awesome. So the, and, can go you, ahead, James. you said you're a little bit nervous about hard coding the, the tip in the, in the wallet. Can you just say more about that so I can understand the concerns there better? Yeah. So, so there's really, there's two parameters on each transaction that are related to 1559, um, the max network fee. And, and here you can see us representing it as the user's own preferred currency. So you could say, we, we can say, maybe I don't want to pay more than $15. And then we can divide that by the estimated gas limit and the gas price, and then uh, and we're able to give you a, a max fee, and that's that's some nice user experience. However, there, there is a second parameter, the tip, 
and and that one is it's uh it's supposed to be like kind of trivial um i, I don't know if somebody else wants to take a, a swing at the role it's it's to include to preserve minor incentive is my understanding because if you didn't have the tip at all then the entire transaction fee would get burned um and uh, but but it is the the remaining minor incentive and so within a block it's the only thing the miners getting and so there is a incentive preserved for miners to order by tip within a block so it, it maybe doesn't matter if everything's moving up and down you'll if you're not in the first block because your tip is low you'll be in the next block but but as a wallet i don't if if the if the price jumps up i don't want my users to be the ones that are waiting an extra block is that is that a I don't know if I'm doing a great job of explaining that, but um, so if there is a sudden surge where a block is full, um, then the miners are going to pick the highest tips, and wallets are currently advised by the EIP, anyways, to hard code the tip. Um, this puts wallets in a weird uh, rivalrous position to make their users pay more. Could you possibly um, hard code it as a function instead of as like a static value? Yeah, I mean, we could we could do everything that we do today because you know, as as some of the criticisms have suggested, the tip becomes another single price auction, um, like like fifteen fifty five is trying to avoid. So we could do all the stuff that we're doing today, and you know, the good news is it only applies within that band. So and and you're still uh, subject to the max fee, so that's that's nice. But but yeah, it does mean that we we might have to preserve, for example, our current. Uh, uh, bidding logic under the hood and just apply it to this smaller within the block option. The and the other thing you can do is you can use kind of algorithms that look at uh, kind of what happens to previous transactions to adjust the chain. Like you could do something that says uh, the tip keeps on decreasing by 10% every time you send the transaction until you notice your your transaction not getting included within a block and then it jumps up again. Um, yeah, yeah, we could do that. Um, it, we we might want to look at what other transactions are doing too. But but yeah, like seeking the minimum tip definitely seems like the like a component of the right strategy. The designs are, are really cool. Then thanks. Yeah. Uh, one thing: if if all the tips are set to the same value, I think ideally I want to give priority to the users who are putting a higher max fee because they expose themselves to more risk. And if I put a high max fee, it also means I really want my transaction to get in, like regardless of the price, like I have a very high value for it. So how does setting like a uniform tip, uh, it's not able like to discriminate between, uh, let's say users who have high value and users who have low value. So perhaps like also a tip, which is a function of the max fee, like if you set a high max fee, you tip a little epsilon extra. Um, I think something like that might be reasonable. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, possibly. I, I mean, one of the goals, uh, I think, of both 1559 and escalators to avoid and minimize overpayment. And so I'm just a little apprehensive about any strategy that basically adds a uh, fixed uh, cost. Because, um, you know, some, some user may just steadily have more they're willing to spend and uh, now they're permanently paying more. Maybe that's not the worst. Uh, yeah, it's worth considering. And the just some context for the, the the theory behind the fee being fixed, not in the wallet, but having like approaching this fixed value is that it there is a the, the risk of it, uh, the uncle risk for including a transaction is pretty similar for whatever. That and is so, correct. So that is theoretically where the it could be the same and it could always be the same and miners would accept it if it approaches that value. But I, I mean, you guys are the wallet people. So I, I, as far as choice and suggestion versus baked in, I, I mean, I don't want to decide for anybody, but it's, I would lean with wallets on deciding what they are most comfortable with. Yeah, so it's worth having in the mix. If there aren't any other questions, I could uh, could wrap up. Um, yeah, yeah, I think this is, uh, I think I covered everything I was hoping to about this. So thank you. So in terms of next steps here, um, 
what do you think is the best way to get like more community feedback on like the tip versus escalator and, and if and how they work together? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm wondering how we can kind of get to a point where we, we have like a, a decision on that. Is there like a consortium of wallets we could consult? There's the Ethereum magicians is pretty much the closest thing using the, the wallets tag there. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be valuable to have like a, a thread on these magicians sharing kind of these, these high level mockups and, and we can, I don't think there's a consortium of wallet, but like we can probably reach out to, you know, different, different people uh, in the space build, building wallets um, and, and get their feedback. Yeah, that sounds great. Oh, there, there was one other point um, just, just worth highlighting. There, there was the, the concerned raise. Um, just if in the scenario that uh, miners colluded to include under half full blocks, i.e. eliminating the base fee as much as possible, then the tip does become the primary bidding parameter. And, and so it, it might be valuable for us to incorporate an uh, escalator-like interface even in the case where, uh, where we are trying to uphold the uh, 1559 type uh, max fee uh, interface. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just like partly strategizing, like as a wallet developer, I'm not sure what the miners are going to do. So just being defensive for users, we, it, it, like we, we are weighing like, is it necessary for us to pre strategize for that happening? There was one minor idea that I had yesterday and maybe it requires some validation, but um, if we think of the half full blocks as uh, our goal, then can we actually incentivize miners to come back to that um, base fee and the half block by burning some of the minor reward for the unused gas both below the half. So if you have a block that has 16 million or 20 million, however you calculate that. So if the gas is not used up to 10 million, then it's more for the block. I think there are some bad implications that a security of such a block falls down in the case of uh, network underutilization. So if we don't have much of a demand for the network, then actually just decrease security. But at the same time, um, it acts as a mechanism of prevent miners from going below the minimum just to decrease the base fee because it will hurt their rewards. Hmm. I mean, I guess the challenge is kind of designing that kind of mechanism correctly because like the thing that we're targeting is not a, uh, like every block being at 50%, right? The thing Um, the thing that we're targeting is a kind of medium run average of uh, 50%. So, I don't know, we need a lot more thinking. And this idea is kind of there in a paper by Basu. Um, of like, you only give a full reward to the miner if the block is full enough, but it's with a different mechanism. So I don't know if it would work with EIP, probably yes. But then you would have a lot of, I guess, stuffing like the miner might be incentivized to put his own transactions. So you might have more heavy blocks, even though the transactions are kind of not like just fluff. Sorry, just to clarify here, this is the idea that if we're over the target gas limit, that the a portion of the base fee would be burned, whereas if you're under it, it would be rewarded to the miner. So normally the whole base fee is being burned, but um we could change the amount of the burned fee to be like split between the minor reward and just lost forever, depending on how, how much the block is filled with the transaction. So you still would prevent the incentivization of the miners to include more transactions because they would still burn some of those fees and only some of them would come back to them. So they would be in loss if they just generated fake transactions. Uh, but at the same time, they would be incentivized to include the actual transactions from the network. I just think that's like um, this 
ability to burn some part of the fee gives us a lot of opportunities in the future. So I just, I just give it as a idea for future. I would like to uh, make the EOP 15599 at this time to be too complicated. So maybe it's just something to think of for the future. I think we'll have a lot of opportunities to introduce more things later. Oh, thanks. The uh, having the minor tip be an escalator is actually like the more I thought about it is the best defense against miners by pushing down that value too much because there's a natural pressure to push it back up. If there's an escalator telling them they're going to they, like whoever, whoever is the one that breaks gets paid more like whichever minor and like they just will mm -hmm. because the escalator can do it. That is the simplicity of that. I really like. So I've, I've actually really liked the combination of those proposals. Thinking back for um, Dan to your designs, the, when you're like, I, I know I'm not a, a wallet designer and things. So I, but I, I'm wondering the choice at abstracting out like base fee and the minor tip and um, versus like having them have to set the, the like choosing max fee where you you could choose base fee and then the minor tip which ends up being max fee or like what was your thought process when or or design goals when you're going going into that i'd like to kind of hear more from the wallet maker point of view yeah sure sure and and no need to apologize uh, we're all users of this so uh, you've got as much insights as as any of us uh could, could you restate the question, sir? Yeah, I, the part of abstracting out the base fee that's happening. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if we're, oh, so like, so let's say so for, for the happy path, like where we're trying to make it as simple as possible, because I think one of the goals is giving the simplest possible experience, especially for next block inclusion. Uh, um, so we aren't showing the base fee here. But we are actually kind of hiding and representing it as an expected fee, to be honest. So this actually is the base fee. Um, we're not calling it the expected fee to the user. Um, the reason for that is just because we're trying to convey to the user what what is really relevant to them. And so in terms of what it means to the user is it's kind of the top of the bell curve, right? Is it's, it's a likely amount that they do pay. And then that really isolates it and separates it from what they're adjusting. Because if we put this number up front, it looks more like it's the actual number they're going to pay and could make somebody feel very uncomfortable if we're like suggesting a default of like a $10 transaction or something. Mm -hmm. And realistically, it's going to be less than half of that or something probably. And so we wanted to emphasize the expected fee without having to make every user understand the, the algorithm. Um, so then in this case, the minor tip is kind of hidden in the 0.42 yeah, in this one, this is kind of assuming the, the happy path where maybe the minor tip is hard coded or, you know, insignificant enough in most of the cases that we can just leave it alone. So, so I wanted to represent that, even though, even though my greatest fears are that that's not the case, I, I wanted to re reflect that and, and show how nice it could be. Okay. So then in the case, that you would add something under here. So if, if we did have minor tip be a choice in there, would you have them like say, so the expected fee is being that, and then the max fee is the escalator top and the expected fee is the beginning of the escalator. And then there would be an option for a, a minor tip. Uh, yeah, so if we were composing them, yeah, sorry, we, should, we probably should have a third batch. Um, it was near the end of this process that we realized they, they actually could compose. I, I think that when composing them, it ends up looking a lot more like the escalator because it tends to have the more complicated inputs. You've got like four. Uh, well, yeah, you've got you've got a starting amount and you've got a, a an ending amount and you've got a range. So you've got like three parameters. That's a lot to put in front of a user. Um, we were kind of trying to simplify it here. Um, in this case, you know, we can say what the range will be, and we can we could even say what it will probably cost. And uh, but yeah, it's 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 likely that if we want to combine the two, that it'll it'll inherit the complexity of the more complex algorithm. Um, I like having the expected fee in there as a, a abstract as like letting them know base fee. That just 
sounds nice to have them have the information and then having the the uh like fast medium or slow be representative of the t the tip that they're going to be putting in and have that be like an escalator so or i don't know yeah it's, it's well, i'm like i'm, we, I'm, could probably, I'm we could probably say expected at the top of this and then that just be so so we could separate the, the expected fee and even the max from the time preference. So that'd be like a, another way of combining these. Um, that, that'd be very reasonable. Cool. I like how this is making my mind like, like uh, put in, in thoughts that I hadn't thought before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's definitely the goal. Uh, feel free to clip around and, and rearrange. We'll, we'll make these designs available after the call and uh, feel free to make Franken designs and uh, suggest other things. Cool. Okay, uh, the next thing on, on the agenda was uh, talking about uh, non proof of work networks. So uh, basically what would happen to the, the public networks running clique as well as uh, private networks. So that run different consensus algorithm. Do you want to have 1559 for all types of consensus mechanisms or is it just a proof of work thing? Yeah, so my concern about it uh, was, uh, you know, uh, usually when uh, you use private networks, you set all uh, all fork blocks to zero. And uh, because this heap is, de is designed to, to be uh, uh, a transition from legacy transactions to new transactions and also new uh, block uh, header fields. Uh, for example, let's say, uh, do we want to allow to start directly with uh, only E1559 transactions? And in that, in that case, we will have a part of the gas pool available for legacy transactions that will uh, never be used, uh, actually. Uh, so yeah, and also uh, maybe that would mean that uh, we, we should make the transition period configurable. I don't know, but... Uh, yeah, you know, because if we apply directly uh, E1559 rules, we might have some issues uh, on private networks. Yeah, it was my concern. I guess I my question, um, oh, is there sorry. value to having 1559 in a case where you don't have miners and on most networks that are not mainnet, you don't have this like congestion slash first price auction problem. Um, but then the problem is you have test nets that don't reflect, you know, mainnet. Uh, yeah. Do click networks have transact to have congestion problems? Like they, or is it just that they don't because they're not mainnet? Or I think they, they don't because they're not mainnet and because the blocks can be produced quite rapidly, right? Like you yeah. can set the block time on a click network to whatever you want. Yeah, it's a combination of both factors, yeah. The network is are generally... Uh, and, and the block oh, size yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, maybe we can say it, it, uh, this heap does not bring value on consortium networks or non proof of fork networks, maybe. I think we should bring it up at an awkward devs call. Yeah. That'd be a good next yeah. step. So okay. that other clients can chime in. Yeah, makes sense. Like here, I from think Peter or some of the other guys who wrote the click spec. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think also it might it might be just like a separate EAP. Like maybe, you know, there's a there's like a 1559 equivalent for non proof of work that works, but because there's like all these particularities, you maybe want just like a different spec for it. Um, or, and, and, and maybe that could be done in the future as well. Like it doesn't necessarily have to all, all be done at the same time. Yeah, that makes sense. That would fit with the existing, there's an EIP for click network for that define kind of click networks. So you could, uh, that's like a good pattern for what's happened previously. Okay, good to know. Um, anything else on that? 
Uh, last thing, so this wasn't on, on the agenda, the originally, but uh, kind of got brought up uh, in terms of having more test nets and stuff like that. Like, what do we think are the next steps here? Um, it feels like there's a lot of just community consultation to do around uh, both the UX of it, uh, the, the the click network stuff we talked about, and and just getting some some tidying up to do in the EAP uh, with regards to to the block size. Um, so. Does it make sense to start taking, talking about like more public test nets now, or should we just kind of get all those things done and maybe have another meeting in a couple of weeks to, to to discuss that specifically? I, I may have unpopular opinion that the test nets will bring us barely any benefit in simulating the behavior of the AP one five five nine because we would need congestion, we would need users. So I think simulations would be better. Yes, for test nets, I think one test net would be enough to move props and half half to um to ap1559 and the standards transaction processing and see how the mainly wallet developers and users uh, feel about the change we have well earlier we talked about rolling out a new proof of work test net and so it may just be good to start it with this uh, this way yes yeah. so if you think about moving something instead of Robson, because Robson is too big nowadays, I feel. It's all about deploying all the contracts on the new network as well, but I think everyone will welcome that. So basically you start a new proof of work network and I guess you started in kind of the legacy mode. You let everybody deploy their own contracts for, I don't know, say the first million blocks or whatever, and then and then you add the IP 1559. You basically hard forked to EIP 1559 pretty early on, correct? No, maybe start it straight away with 5050 because if people have to do a lot of actions at oh. the beginning to deploy things, then we'll have a great testing ground. Because oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, and how, I guess, before we set that up, we probably need resolution on both the escalator fee and and the the fixed versus variable block size, correct? Or do we just set it up with 1559 as is today and we basically hard fork it as we make changes in, in the EAP specification? I think we should have a pretty stable spec before we okay. launch a new testnet. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, you know, everyone here also has like a job, like nobody I think is working full time on, on this EAP. Um, and it feels like we do have a couple of things to figure out over the next few weeks. Um, so then maybe on our next call, once we have better visibility on the spec, we can discuss uh, just the, the, the kind of how we, how we go about launching the testnet. Yeah, it seems it, it seems like it would be nice to launch something that we could destroy easily and then iterate on that and then say this will be the the real one and then have the, and then have that be part of sunsetting robston there's one thing like i feel that many users are waiting for some replacement for robston which would be still proof of work but would be much smaller and easier to sync and since gilly is already like nearly three million blocks um and in the past, we were spawning new test nets every two, three, four million blocks. It's always a great incentive to people start deploying things. If we tell them that this is something that would destroy later, nobody will move their contracts there. Do you mean? Yeah. And I, you, I feel like. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, uh, you're you're suggesting building earlier ones that we are going to destroy and then and then telling everyone this is the one to migrate to later was that what you were suggesting or i mean if you think about def only test nets then maybe we can but so i don't think they'll be that important as the actual new proof of work test net that would have eip 1559 that everyone would feel invited to and see as an opportunity to replace robston with yeah, I, I, I think that makes sense. And we that's also something we should probably bring up on the core devs call tomorrow um, to get other people's thoughts. But like it gives us the time to get to a stable spec, you know, not necessarily fully stable, but 
say 80% of the way there. Uh, we can also like have more of a, like better communications to the community. Like, hey, this is the test net, you can join it today. You know, it's gonna be a bit rough, but it, it should be mostly there. Um, and, and similarly at the same time, say we're kind of phasing out Robston as this other test net becomes more and more battle tested. The, just thinking about how we're using the, uh, the ephemeral test net for basically testing consensus between client implementations. Is there value in doing that kind of a thing first as part of just making sure clients are, are agreeing on what the specification is before we do that? So I think this is what the BaseU and Get team already have kind of, it's not a public test net, but it's like a local test net on, uh, on, on our machines. But yeah, but uh, I agree. Uh, having something more repeatable and with, uh, you know, because it's a test net uh, on a local machine with no automation, etc. So it's not really repeatable. So, and it's only Get and Bezu, and uh, I, I, uh, I build Get from the source PR. So we should maybe use uh, some. Uh, release build or something like that. I don't know, but uh, I agree we should, uh, it will be nice to to have a, a test net easy to deploy and easy to destroy and with all client implementations. So then should we do an ephemeral test net for 1559 with that kind of in, involved and that we you could roll that out earlier before things get fully specified even. Yeah. Is that something you could lead? Um, I don't know. Uh, we need I don't to know, know, I mean, know what like, that meant. I don't even, we, yeah, I don't we even need know what look, that means. So what Geth does, they use like puppies, puppets, I don't know how to pronounce it anyways. Um, but like, I don't think at basic we spent much time looking into how it actually works. Uh, we can probably look into it and, and, and we will be kind of anyways for Berlin. Um, mm. so, we so we could have a, a get forth run Puffeth and then you, and then base you sync to that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that. I guess the, the short answer is we don't know yet, but we can definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's much simpler than that in the end. So the, the only thing that we need for spawning ephemeral test net, if we decide to have one, is just sharing the chain spec genesis file, and, and that's enough. And uh, it will be more important to have a spec of the AP1559 uh, to be finalized, uh, rather than just to prepare infrastructure. Infrastructure, everyone will be able to spawn their nodes and connect whoever starts it. Uh, it should be like... You know, it, it might be more complicated than, than that because uh, we decided, uh, uh, you know, we said we don't know the optimal numbers for the, the parameters for, of this heap. Uh, uh, and we decided to make those configurable so that we don't have to rebuild every time we want to test with different parameters. So that means that uh, we would have to uh, launch uh, multiple ephemeral test nets with different configurations to, to, find, to find the optimal numbers. This is what we said, but uh, I don't know if we still want to do that. So or this is which... where I said that I think simulations would be better than spawning those test nets. Mm. But how big would be the effort to build those simulators? I think it'll be lower than analyzing the data from the test nets. And uh, less expensive, I think spawning that many test nets will be quite expensive. Yeah. Previously, looking at simulations, it's very expensive. Um, I get, like doing robust simulations is one of the hardest things that have been uh, that has been that to get done for this because the cost has ended up being really, really high. Like sep to kind of separating concerns, I see value in or um, and clarify if I'm off on this that having, having all of those different variables, making sure that clients come to consensus between the different variables being different is, is valuable to have. And then the layer on top of that is what is the optimal version of those configurations? Yeah, okay. Like, 
So, so that's two, two different concerns, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so like the the ephemeral testnet, I think would solve the, are all the clients agreeing on what the yeah. configurable things do? And you could you can test stuff and that wouldn't necessarily get you to the ideal configuration, but mm -hmm. the next step would then be if identifying the ideal configuration uh, the, uh, or iterating on it. But you, yeah. you, you kind of need both. Does that, does that fit, Thomas, or does that uh, make yeah, sense? Yeah, definitely I'm not against it. It's just uh, I was weighing these two possibilities and thinking of what is more useful. But uh, I think every team and we together, we should support the effort. So if you, if you consider this as an idea that would help a lot on some field, then I definitely would join that effort. So, and yeah, and I think that that's probably one of the concerns as well, right? Where it's just like the skill sets we need to do simulations are kind of different from doing the test nets. And, and I think if, if Nethermind can help on the simulation sides, that there's a lot of value there. Um, I'm not sure on the basic team, we, we can help much. Um, yeah. I'm happy to give a hand. Okay, like simulations, I've been trying like to do some. Uh, but I think it'd be good like to also have a, like the client perspective on uh, what to simulate exactly, like how do we make it robust, but have scenarios that kind of match the reality as well. So I think that's kind of the expectation from having a testnet that we can have like real data, but it's, um, yeah, if it's not incentivized or if it's not congested, it's not clear what we'll get. So I do agree that simulations can be helpful. We're, we're blessed to have Barnabas. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can Holy probably cow. help. I guess when I say we, I mean, Abdel and Ian can probably help feed yes. some of those like use cases or, or, or scenarios. Um, uh, are you on the Discord channel, Barnabas? I would be happy to have a chat with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I am happy to chat with you as well. <laughs> okay. Nice. Uh, I don't know what is your handle, but. Uh, yeah, I, I can find you. I don't know. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Cool. So, was there anything else anyone wanted to discuss? I had a question on Twitter that I didn't know how to answer. Go for it. Which I'll put in. It came from Alexi. And like, what happens to the 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 pool? I as like I'm not sure yet if the transaction pool behavior is clarified in the EIP or whether old transactions can be readmitted to the transaction proof once base fee goes down, its congestion eases. Like actually, they will like will they be kicked out of the pool or if if you have like a like as base fee goes down, are things included? like mempool holds on to those or do they get rid of them mm, yeah that's a good question i guess uh, what would be the right way to think to, to think about this i guess the, the right way to think about it would be that like there's some fixed amount of memory that each client has in their pool and so the clients would just keep kicking out the transactions that are least likely to ever be included I think we can leave the mempool behavior exactly the way it is so because uh, at the moment what we do is, I think in most of the clients, or if not all of the clients, the mempool just holds the best X transactions sorted by gas price, taking into account also if the nonces align with the nonces in the state, which means it doesn't change even if the base fee is there, it's just the block producers will not be including the transactions that are not meeting the base fee criteria but still the transactions will be ordered by the gas price in, in all, in both cases, it's exactly the same behavior. And there is no need to drop them because you have expectation that the base fee can go down and you don't have any better transactions anyway. So your mempool will be limited by the limit of mempool as it is now. I think they can stay there and wait for the better times. And from a wallet perspective, we, of course, remember the transactions you've sent and we periodically resend. And if you are blocked for a very long time, provide speed up or cancel options. So yeah, it's very similar to today in that scenario. Okay. And as from like a, a mechanism perspective, as if I had a low base fee with a high minor tip, 
then theoretically it would take longer to get to my base feet, even if my minor tip was larger. I guess depending on how we, like if, if I had a dollar base fee and a 50 cent minor tip versus having a 50 cent base fee and a dollar minor tip, then theoretically the, the larger base fee would be included first. I think you mean max fee, but uh, yes. Uh, it's it's going to come down and the, the max fee is going to, it applies to the tip. Okay, so then we we don't we the transaction sets the max fee, and then as things go down, all right, that helps. Thank you. Is it worth like specifying kind of that we're keeping it the same as far as mempool and things go, or or um, like making that more clear from a specification perspective? The, the mempool is not really specified in any description of the consensus or papers. Every client manages the mempool their own way. Uh, they happen to be doing that similarly, but I, I don't think we need to add this into consensus or this discussion. As long as we don't raise concerns from the client and developer's perspective, I think it means that it's fine. Cool. Uh, I guess, uh one, one question I just uh, came up with when, when, when you were talking about like um, max um, tip versus max base fee, wouldn't it theoretically make sense to switch to specifying just the max tip and the max total? That way you could never end up in a situation where basically your max tip plus max base fee would have been sufficient, but just because you specified a high tip but not a high uh, base fee, your transaction can't end up being included? I'm liking it, but totally describe it again. Yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, so I'm, I'm, I just came up with the no, so, so it might, might just over, be overlooking something, but the idea, like basically the, the example there with a the, like 50 cent um, base fee and one $1 um, tip uh, was, was the other way around. There could be a situation where you would be willing to pay a high tip, but just because your base fee, your max base fee is a little bit below whatever what the current base fee is, your transaction just cannot ever make it in. But obviously that's not like your intent because you don't really care if, if, if whatever you're paying ends up with a miner. You only want, want like to have a maximum tip to, so, so the miner can't just like always take whatever your, your, your maximum willingness to pay is and then just take that. So, but if you specify like the maximum tip you're willing to pay and then the maximum total you're willing to pay, I think that would basically cover the situation where like, like the, the, you're basically willing to pay any base fee that uh, as long as like the, the, the total you're willing to pay is, is not basically gone over. This is how the proposal is at the moment. If I understood what you were saying correctly, uh, what you're specifying is not the maximum base fee that you are willing to pay, but it's the maximum of the sum of base fee plus your tip. So the tip is ah, fixed. Okay. But if, if the total of the two goes above your max fee, uh, what you're paying as a user is capped to the to the max fee. Okay. That was okay, yeah, one, of the, one of the difficulties in having like let's say EIP 1559 and the escalator together is that your the base fee might be increasing at the same time your tip is increasing. So in the escalator you have some certainty. Let's say the plain vanilla escalator no EIP 1559. You have some certainty that you're going to reach your max fee after the number of blocks that you specified. But when you combine the two together, you can have kind of like an additive effect and you end up like topping out at your max fee much earlier than you, than you thought you would. So ah. yeah, that's one of the difficulties I see. Okay, then sorry for the confusion. So would the, solu would the solution to that being having one of them be an escalator and one of them not being so that, that there isn't that race condition? I so in this link that I shared, I, I kind of look at two things. So you start like the escalator at the current level of the base fee, but then either your escalator is fixed, in which case you have certainty on how your tip is evolving, but you run the risk that maybe the base fee gets way over what your tip currently is, in which case mm -hmm. you can't be included. So the better idea and one in which you can also uh, reduce it to plain EIP 1559, is to have like a floating escalator where you, you're like on the base fee, but the tip is increasing as well. So what you pay is the current base fee plus 
de-escalating tip. But then you have this additive effect where if base fee is increasing and your fee is also increasing, your tip is increasing, uh, you can reach your max fee, yeah, quite fast. But so I don't know. I, I, I don't know if any of these designs are reasonable. I think the floating escalator is the most reasonable. I don't know that it solves like the issues we want to solve. Maybe that's something we, which would be nice to simulate actually. So thinking about it from the user perspective, I I wouldn't mind if it escalates to my max fee quickly if that means it gets in. Yeah, oh. that's reasonable, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. From uh, how do how do you analyze it? Like it yeah, yeah. wing parts, which makes it a bit like a uh, more tricky, I think. But uh, maybe maybe it works in practice. Like the escalating fee anyways is, it's really to give the information that you wanna go above everyone else faster. So where is everyone else? The kind of like intuition is that everyone is at the base fee or just like a, an epsilon above. Um, and so escalating the tip means you wanna get like ahead of the crowd. Um, so yeah, in case your max, max fee is reached earlier, then I guess you should have paid more if you wanted it faster. So I, I don't know, maybe it's, it's reasonable. Also, I assume the version with the escalator would be more complicated from a mempool perspective as well, because like ordering then all of a sudden isn't straightforward anymore. You could still order by tip or by the max fee minus the remaining tip in case you are topping out. I think the ordering would still be okay. But I do think you need to keep around the, to answer Alex's questions, I think you need to keep around the transactions even if uh, uh, the base fee is currently too high. Like I can think of an edge case where it's only too high for one period and then it goes down and somebody resubmits the same transaction as mine and gets faster. Like I've waited all this time and I only got kicked out of the mempool because of this one block deviation. Uh, I don't know if it's really fair or if it's a good idea. But I also don't know really how the transaction pools are managed right now. So maybe it doesn't work, I don't know. I think it does complicate it a little bit because right now it's ordered based on the gas price, whether or not that's the legacy gas price or the EIP 1559 gas price. And so if there's this escalation occurring from block to block, um, then the mempool would essentially have to refactor that price that each block could reorder based on the new price. Oh, so more, more operations. But the, it escalates, but it's also, hmm. if it's just the escalator, it's kind of linear. So you have some expectation on the, on the price, but yeah, maybe it, it, there are some issues, I'm not sure. In any case, I don't think that's a good enough reason to dismiss it as an option. Anything else people want to discuss? Okay, so I guess in terms of next steps, uh, there's a couple of things that uh, we're going to bring up on the core devs call tomorrow. Um, uh, Dan said he'll put uh, his mockups on an ETH magician thread somewhere so we can try and get more attention from the community on them. Um, in terms of simulations, I guess uh, Barnabé and Abdel, you can have a chat and, and see uh, how, how to get started there. Yes. Is there anything else? Um, talking about oh, push networks. Yeah, yeah, on all core devs. On yeah, all core splitting devs. the EAPs. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, splitting the EAPs or uh, adding in a fix the minor 
the gas, like change minor gas consensus decisions, EIP. Yeah. And uh, getting, figuring, I guess that's not a next step, but just something to figure out is how to get more feedback on some of these design things. Yeah, so I think once we have them up on like ETH Magicians and, and Dan has has his, uh, has has kind of his, uh, I forget how you call that. Anyways, the link where you can see the design uh, mm -hmm. set up, then uh, we can reach out, you know, the people at like MyCrypto, at Coinbase Wallet and, and other wallets in the space and, and try to get their inputs. Uh, I'm happy to, to take the lead on that. Cool. And um, then there was getting the, uh, if, if we are going to do an ephemeral net that uses Puppet or is that something, how, how to approach that and who's going to do it? I think it? we should, yeah, we should ask on all core devs and see, you know, what's the, what's the overhead of doing that and, and uh, yeah, what's, what's the value. Okay. That's the ones I'm remembering. Cool. Anything else? Oh, and yeah, I'll, I'll ask. So because several people asked for the recording, I'll see with Hudson if we can maybe just straight up upload this to the Ethereum YouTube, uh, because especially Dan's presentation was was just pretty great. And, and I feel like, you know, the, the transcript will never do it justice. Uh, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll see with Hudson if that's possible. Um, Otherwise, if anybody on here wants the Zoom link, just ping me and I'll send it to you. Yeah, Griffin, I'm sure the transcript will be great, by the way. But yeah, <laughs> the, the, the presentation was really good. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for hosting Bye. this, Thank too. You. This is Of course. Thank you awesome. so much. Bye, everyone.